So yeah, welcome back everybody. Welcome to the uh, final session, uh, security session that is, by where GSC is not finished uh, for the day by, uh, by a long shot, but um, this is the last security session for the day. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome back Mark Nelson, the king of Racketh, as I like to call him, <laughs> from, the, from the IBM uh, Racketh hey, development team. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you. Oh, by the way, we coordinated today, didn't we, Mark? We were just yes, saying we about our matching shirts. So <laughs> Mark's in uh, blue, I think, and I'm in red. Yes. So uh, very good. So yeah, this is session 7Q. Um, if uh, just a quick reminder, if you have not done feedback for previous sessions, like Isha sessions, for example, or any sessions you've attended, please, uh, please do do that. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Mark. Welcome back. It's good to be back. And thank you, everybody, for joining us here. My morning, your afternoon. And if you're watching this on recording, well, we have no idea what time it is. Uh, the topic here is the path to an encrypted RACF database. It's something that the, the development team has been working on for quite a while. Very happy to bring this to the marketplace. Some people said it couldn't be done. It can be done. It was done. So uh, I am here in Poughkeepsie. The arrow points to where I work. Sadly, I had to work from home today. So I'm about three miles from that location, a little bit, uh, little bit east of there. But uh, it's still a great place to be. Uh, as I pointed out yesterday, we had the privilege of the President of the United States visiting, uh, and I got to be in the audience. I, I put this up because something I forgot to mention yesterday is those left side photos, that is, uh, I, it, that's the IBM quantum machine, right? And uh, Poughkeepsie is the home of, well, one of the homes of the IBM Q, the IBM quantum machine. So that's the top picture there, the IBM Q machine that's over in a building that's very close to the building that I'm in. It's building uh, just a little bit south of me. Uh, and of course, we still are the home of the modern mainframe. We are the home of the mainframe, proud to have been that since uh, 1964. And it's kind of nice that we have both the current and the next generation of technologies all sitting there right on the west side of the Hudson, or should be the east side of the Hudson River. It's kind of cool. Uh, that is what the quantum machine looks like. Uh, I, I do love the fact that there's our CEO there, the president overlooking. Uh, and I, I know somebody in the technical audience was saying, don't touch that, because that piece that he is going near, if that had been a real one, is awfully cold. It's a few thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. Uh, and that just amazes me about the technology, the physics involved in order to get the concept of the quantum computer working. All right, so anyway, that's uh, POTUS, Pekip, uh, President of the United States in Poughkeepsie. Uh, when Mark Wilson presents, I love the fact that he always puts up that, that lovely photo of himself doing that scuba diving with the shark. I, I don't scuba dive. That to me is something that I, I just don't have, uh, I, I don't have the guts for it, but I like to fly. And when I go over to the UK, uh, I do like to find a flight instructor and actually take a little instruction. This is me flying in Cambridge with an instructor who I found out after the fact was a very experienced RAF pilot. And he asked me if I wanted to learn how to do a proper steep turn, right? And this is what he taught me. That is a steep turn. <laughs> Thoroughly enjoyed it, a lot of fun. And uh, I do like to talk a bit about flying uh, because I think it's the ultimate in risk management activities. And when people talk about security, we always start talking the geeky, we'll, we'll talk Rack F VSAM, we'll talk about all kinds of stuff. And we sometimes forget that the business that we're actually in is risk management. And flying is all about risk management. And I've talked about it at the conference and yeah, I think I'll do it again at some point. All right, so let's move on. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the RACF database. So the RACF database, right, it is the container, the data set that contains security information. It's your user registry. It's where we'll have the relationships of users to groups. It's where you'll have your resource definitions, the rules for access to various and sundry things. It's also where you'll see your system security options. Most of those setter ops options, boom, get stuck right into the RACF database. There is some security stuff that's actually not in the RACF database, things like your RACF remote sharing facility topology. And, and actually the location information to find the RACF database, that's actually somewhere else. It's either in a module that you've assembled and linked, right, the data set names table, uh, or it's in, in Parm Lab. So you got a couple of choices there for where you put it. But, you know, again, that's information, very important, not inside the RACF data set. Just wanted to point that out. 
Now, remember, your RACF data set can, RACF database, I should say, and we'll talk about the difference in a moment. Your RACF database, you can have a primary one. If you're using RACF, you have to have a primary. You can also have a backup. And when we say a backup RACF database, we mean a live spinning RACF database that when you do an add to the primary, we will replicate that information, if you have asked us to, into the backup. Now, one of the things you can do is you can split the RACF database, right? RACF database can consist of multiple data sets. And if you do that, the set of data sets that you have for your primary must be identical to the uh, set uh, the sets that you have for your backup. So if you've got three primaries, well, you gotta have three backup data sets. So there was this statement of direction uh, a little less than two years ago. IBM intends to enhance pervasive encryption through RACF support for the use of an encrypted vSAM data set as its database in specific configurations. We're going to return to that statement in a few moments. Uh, but you know, why did we choose to go this way as opposed to another way? The other way would have been, you know, RACF could have chosen to call all of these encryption services itself. Nothing to stop us from calling ICSF to do, you know, do key management, whatever we need to do it for, retrieve stuff, right? And then, you know, do the other things necessary to actually perform encryption and decryption. In fact, early on, we, we went down that path of, yeah, well, what would it take to do that? But then it dawned on us, somebody's already done that. And that somebody is the access managers, the DFPs of the world. In our case, vSAM. Why don't we leverage what they have already done, developed and tested and build ourselves on top of it? Now, there were some additional things that had to happen as RACF has some slightly unique requirements, but you, know, you take the big step back, uh, the RACF database, right? Was just a fixed 4096 data set, right? All we're doing is we're reading records, right? Now the mechanism we were using, right? Was, well, we were our own access method. What that means is RACF, everything in RACF we address by relative byte address, by RBA. We would take that RBA value, run it through a little mathematical operation, we, which takes as input knowing exactly where the data set starts in terms of cylinder head and record, use the RBA value to figure out where the cylinder head record of the record we cared about was, and then we physically fetch or update that exact spot on the disk. Right? We use something called EXCPVR. Right? That's really what it means to be your own access method. You are literally reading and writing at the disk architecture level. And when I say the disk architecture level, I, sh I sh should be clear that you know, nowadays they're all you know, not spinning devices like some of us grew up on. Right? They could be solid state devices, SCSI devices. That, that architecture is emulated. But, but fundamentally, it's still cylinder head record is your method of access. Right. When you're dealing with an access method, they, they take you. It's a, it's a level of abstraction. You don't have to worry about things at that level. Right. You don't worry about the cylinder head record. You say, I want record one, record 37, record 422. Right. And it turns out, RACF, because of the fact that we're a 4096 uh, record size, the relative byte address to record number conversion is pretty straightforward. It's a simple division. Which, we, which can be accomplished by lopping off bits and a simple mathematics operation of then subtracting one, right? So that's how you translate from an RBA into a record number, uh, which is a very fast process. And that's a good thing for us. And, and vSAM, vSAM linear data set is perfectly happy to be accessed in that way. So we give you that, that mechanism of, of choosing to use a vSAM linear data set as your database, right? Why did we choose that? Well, we wanted to still stay consistent with everything else RACF had. In particular, all of the higher level things we do. We have a programming interface called a Chinti. We wanted to make sure there'd be no changes required to anybody using that. If you're using RAC route, request equals extract, no changes to your application. Everything we're doing is, is very much under the cover, so you should be fine there. Next thing is serialization. For those of you who've had the privilege and pleasure of looking at the RACF Systems Programmer's Guide, there's a table in there of the NQs that RACF uh, can do, depending on what operations it's performing. Uh, there's 20 or 25 entries in there. We did not want to change any serialization that RACF was doing. We'll talk in a moment about an additional piece of vSAM uh, serialization that gets done. 
Once you're using vSAM as your RACF data set, well, now you can use the vSAM diagnostics that exist. So for example, you can be using idcams to look at things and stuff like that. You're no longer using block update. Well, you still should be using block update if you're making changes, which you should never do, right? Unless you're under the guidance of RACF level two. Block update is a very powerful surgical knife, right? But if you wanted to use idcams, for example, to print, look at stuff, you can do that. Uh, for folks who manage data sets, they're way more familiar with vSAM than they are with the RACF data set, right? It's, it's a standard beast that folks tend to understand. And the really big thing uh, that we thought was a huge advantage is when IBM is investing in improvements in the IO infrastructure, they always focus on folks who are using the access methods like vSAM, vSAM, QSAM, all of those other things, right? So. And there are some performance advantages that we get to take of under the covers because we're using vSAM and that's a good thing. So back to that statement of direction. The phrase I wanna focus on there, use of a vSAM data set in specific configurations, in specific configurations. And if you have just installed ZOS v2R5 and haven't put any service on, here's what your specific configuration is. You can have a vSAM data set as a part of a RACF database, as long as it's not shared with any other system, right? It can be on a device mark shared, right? But itself cannot be shared with any other system. It must be a RACF database that consists of a single RACF data set. Uh, you can have a primary and a backup, right? You should have a primary and a backup, but if you wanted to take advantage of this, you can't share it, and it must be a single RACF data set you must be running an application identity mapping stage three. Application identity mapping was a function that RACF introduced at least 15 years ago that provides uh, a higher performance index for doing certain types of operations, Unix UIDs, GIDs, and things like that. You need to be at application identity mapping stage three. You should be there already. You probably should have been there for a number of years. There are some other RACA functions uh, that don't work if you're not there. Some, some, there's a search that, uh, option that doesn't work unless you're well past aim stage zero. Your data set must be free from internal errors. So you should be running UT200. You're doing it as part of your copy, your nightly backup. You should have it enabled. Uh, there's some options you specify. So it'll do some index validation and data blocks validation. Presumably you're running database unload. Well, IRDBU00, the database unload utility should be run against it and it should run without errors. Your data set in the base version of this support uh, must be non-SMS managed, right? Which means it must be non-encrypted. Uh, you may not define it in master JCL. And uh, I, I mentioned this earlier this week. I once said nobody in their right mind would be allocating the RACF data set in master JCL. And it was only a few weeks after I'd said that somebody came to me and said, no, no we're doing that. And, and, and my answer is just don't do that. You can't have a backup. You don't, you don't get any in storage buffers. You get very, very few in storage buffers. It's just a bad idea, right? So master JCL, you can't do it for a vSAM data set. And your RACF environment must not be in either Sysplex communications mode or RACF data sharing mode. And, and yeah, RACF data sharing mode requires Sysplex communications, but all of that's off the table. To be honest with you, that environment was useful for kind of a development environment or a very, very limited test environment. Certainly not wor worthy of any real world consideration. The good news is that was the GA of ZOS V2 R5. Uh, breaking news, although it's about six months old at this point, there is a, a, uh, an APAR, OA62267, PTF number is shown there, made available in June of last year that removed the majority of these restrictions, in my opinion, removed all the, all the important ones. So now you can actually effectively have a vSAM RACF data set and an encrypted vSAM RACF data set. And you can choose to do one or the other. Well, you have to do the v encryption on vSAM, but you could go vSAM by itself and then later on choose to encrypt your vSAM data set if you like the stage function because, well, maybe not ready for pervasive encryption for data sets because you, you haven't integrated all the things you need to integrate into your disaster recovery processing, for example. So let's take a look at the restrictions and what went away. So can the RACF vSAM data set be shared? The answer is yes with considerations, we'll get into those in a moment. 
The next one, can you split it? The answer is yes. Can it be SMS managed? Yes, that means you can encrypt it if you want. Well, that's at the bottom there. Can it be encrypted? Yes, it can. Can you run in Sysplex communications node? Yes, you can. Must all the systems still be at ZOS v2R5? That was one of the restrictions last time. Uh, yes, we do not support down-level sharing. And uh, can you define it in master JCL? No. <laughs> So those are the restrictions that we've eliminated. Oh, by the way, I, I, I welcome questions as we're going along. Uh, just put them in the chat and uh, I'll be prompted with them. So thank you, Jamie, for doing that. All right. So that A part that I mentioned, OA62267 with the PTF UJ08531, that's what introduces the support for an a, a encrypted RACF vSAM data set that's split and can be shared. It has some prereqs that you should be aware of. So we're building this technology on top of vSAM. vSAM is building some of its building blocks for this thing on top of Media Manager. And then there's an element in the base part of the operating system called BCF, Base Cryptographic Facilities, something like that. You need to have all three of these PTFs installed and whatever setup they say is required has been done. We'll talk about an example of what that is in, in just a moment. Uh, as you can look from those names, yeah, it makes sense we're built on vSAM, makes sense we're built on Media Manager, and BCF is very tightly related to ICSF. And the whole purpose for these, for the most part, is to ensure that the services that RACF needs are available early enough in the IPL process. Because RACF, it, when I have the conversations with my colleagues in the building that are responsible for the operating system, I like to think RACF comes up very early in the IPL process. In their view of things, you come up very late in the IPL process because they think of things like building link list and LPA and all that as being the IPL process. RACF starts when the subsystems are starting which is, in their view, relatively late in the IPL process, but early for us. But those functions that we need still have to be there. And the functionality that we need is being provided by the three APARs shown here, all of which are prerequed by OA62267. Right. So my point here is when you look at OA62267, do look at the hold for actions for all of its prereqs. Now, the biggest one in my mind is how you configure ICSF. So ICSF, you can uh, point ICSF to its data set in a couple of different ways. But the way that you need to do it for this function is ICSF must be configured with uh, statements in Parm Live, right? And in the ICSF starting parameters, uh, ICSF and ICSF proc parameters, they must be specified, right? So you basically have to have the IPL process know about the ICSF data sets. So that information can be retrieved by VCF at the time that RACF asks us to, like RACF asks it, I should say, to retrieve uh, it wrapped key packages, right? Uh, I'm going to point out that means ICSF does not have to be started at the time we're doing this but ICSF must be configured so BCF can get to the information that it needs to get to, right? So it's the uh, IEA sys will point to a CSF PRM, an ICSF PARM list, and you must have the CKDS keyword in there pointing to a valid CKDS, right? That's a bit of setup. I believe the my colleagues over at ICSF have been recommending Parm Live as their startup mechanism for a number of years. Well, if you're going to be encrypting the RACF data set, it's a must. It's not required for pervasive encryption of data sets, right? It's required for the RACF use of pervasive encryption for data sets. Uh, any questions on that before I get into the uh, serialization sets of concerns? All right, let's move onward. So data sharing considerations. There are a couple of requirements for how you're sharing your RACF data set. The first thing is you must be converting all of your SysC RACF reserves into global NQs. That's been a very strong recommendation from both RACF and our friends over at GRS, Global Resource Serialization. Uh, they're a fan of converting all reserves. Uh, RACF is a fan of, well, at least convert ours, and it's certainly a must 
for the in order to use a RACF vSAM data set. Second one, all the systems that share RACF data sets are defined within the same GRS complex, right? That makes sense because if we're using GRS to, to enforce serialization, if you've got another system in there sharing, that system knows nothing about that serialization. So that's that's a base rule. That's always been, been the rule. And hilarity ensues when you violate that, right? No other systems can be defined into that RACF environment. That's the second piece of it. The concept of two RACF environments in the same sysplex, that's always dangerous, not something you want to do with a RACF vSAM data set. The net of that is, to say it a little more tersely, that the members of the sysplex must match exactly the systems which are sharing the RACF database. And all of those systems much have the same RACF sysplex communications setting. It's the only way that RACF can be assured that its serialization will not conflict unnecessarily and will be shared with all the systems with which it needs to be shared. Right? That's sometimes a statement that, that, that folks get a little concerned about, but that those are the ground rules. Right? And if you have an environment that doesn't match those, we should talk and see you know, what we can do to make the rules uh, work for you. Um, yeah, so just, just let me know, let me know, please. Fundamentally though, just a big step back, what changes from an application viewpoint? And the answer, uh, nothing really. There's no change to any of the application programming interfaces that one has into RACF. So that means RAC Route, Achinti, the RACRF callable services, IRX Util, RACF commands, the output of database unload, all of that stays the same, right? The There are no changes to the serialization. Mentioned that a few moments ago, but there is an additional one that vSAM brings in. There's an additional sys vSAM NQ that gets done at the time RACF opens its data set. That's actually a good thing. And I, I'm sure that some people follow RACFL. And there was a discussion about two, maybe three weeks ago of somebody saying, hey, I just deleted a live RACF data set. And the phrase he used earlier was hilarity ensued. It's, it's really not hilarity. It's, it, it, it's something from which you have to you know, recover. And, and this person did. And folks at the time were then pointing out that, yeah, that's, that's kind of something that has happened before. I had a service colleague who used to talk about this would happen at least once every once a year, maybe twice a year. And it was either the data set got deleted or the data set wasn't marked as unmovable. DSORG equals PSU wasn't marked as unmovable. And the data movement product said, oh, look at that data set. It's, it's, it's not in use. I'm going to move it from here to somewhere else. Problem was it was in use, right? RACF has its, again, its own access manager. It was doing its own serialization with all these NQs, very particular to RACF, but there was no SysDSN NQ, which would have stopped the data mover, right? Well, now there is a SysVSAM NQ, which will stop you from deleting a data set or moving a data set while it's in use. So uh, it, normally serialization is not a good thing. You try to minimize it. I really like the existence of this one. About the only person that I can envision Having you know, having to do any kind of application programming changes, and I'm still not sure you'd actually have to in, in all cases, is if you open the RACF data set and read it directly yourself. You treat it as either a sequential file or, or a BDAM file, and you're, you're, you're basically doing some kind of analysis on it. Uh, yeah, if you're doing that, and there are some add-on products uh, that were doing that, uh, they had to adjust themselves. But we let those, those vendors know early on. We gave them ways of simulating what the database would look like uh, well before we had the support done. We disclosed it at a uh, what's an a, uh, IBM change notification process. So we issued this notice to all of the vendors in April of 2020. We did it again in September. I'm sorry, we had a physical in-person meeting with folks, and then we did this ICN, the, the uh, IBM change notification in August. So all of the vendors of which I'm aware have, have, have adjusted their product to do whatever it needed to do. So that should not be an issue for anybody. So again, if you've got an, an, an application that's doing a rack route request equal something, database unload, a chinti, whatever it might be, your processing command output, screen scraping, that all works still. So how do you create this thing, this rack of vSAM data set? Well, it's just a vSAM linear data set. So you're going to be popping yourselves into IDCAMs, doing a defined cluster. You have to name your RACF data set. It must be linear. You have the option to specify that when 
elements of it are, are whether are deleted or released. I want the space um, erased. You must specify reuse because RACF will read a record, will write a record, then read a record. And then we might we might play games that require vSAM to believe that you can do that. that that's the reuse option. Share options 3.3 is the way you tell vSAM that the person who is opening this data set is completely responsible for serialization. So because of that share options 3.3, there is no sys DSNNQ, and that's exactly what we want because we didn't want to upset RACF's existing serialization mechanisms. Uh, you then have the option of telling it where you want this vSAM data set. I just happen to put it on a volume called Tempo 2. You would probably not put it on a temporary data set, but that's certainly what we do in our test environments. So that's the cluster piece. I, that's kind of the parent information, if you will. The data component is really defining the, I still think of it as a data set, the place on the volume where the data will actually be stored. Uh, you normally don't specify the name for the data component, at least I normally don't, but I do here, and we'll see why when we talk about the migration scenario. Normally, if, uh, if you had not specified a data component name, racf.back.data in this example, one would have been derived for you, and the format would have been, in this example, racf.back.vsam.data. Right? The default is simply to plug those five characters, dot data at the end. And, and we don't want to do that uh, for reasons I'll explain in a few moments. The CI size, control interval size, must be 4096. The cylinder specification uh, as a starting point, make it the same size as whatever your RACF data set is currently. I still recommend uh, allocating it as primary extents only. So that's this one is eight cylinders with zero for the secondary extents, uh, and then free space zero zero. Right? Define your rack of vSAM data set uh, that way, and you'll be on your way. Of course, there's a lot of other stuff you have to do to actually make a rack of vSAM data set. I'll pause again, see if there are any questions. Yeah, Mark, it's Kira. I have a question. Hey, yeah. Um, as one does, if one is right, mi migrating um, ACF2 or top secret to RACF, and you are currently got one sysplex with, say, four systems, can you do vSAM with your RACF systems and have, say, two top secrets or two ACF2s in the same sysplex? Because there's absolutely no way they're going to do serialization, or would you wait until you'd finished and then change the RACF database? So, so I'm looking at that less of a serialization question and more of a, how do I like the stage work? And I do like to do things in discrete chunks. So I would, if you're doing the migration scenario, I would do the migration, but I would migrate into a vSAM data set. Yeah, that's a choice. We should talk a little bit more about that. I can't think of a reason not to, but I'm a developer and you should know that all developers are optimists. Just saying. Yes. Um, so you want to be really safe, do it the old way, and then make it a vSAM data set. Yes, understanding that there's going to be a little <laughs> bit of redundancy of work, and we'll talk about the process in a moment. But you're also making the assumption that one will have, I think you're suggesting that I'll have ACF2 and RACF coexisting in the same sysplex. Yeah, for a period, yeah. For a period. Now, one of the things I, I mentioned is that our serialization stays the same. That's good for, for that scenario. And the only thing we're adding is this new, or should be the only thing that's being added to serialization mix is this uh, vSAM, says vSAM NQ. Well, that's of the format catalog name concatenated with data set name. That should have no conflicts with anything that ACF2 is doing. Yeah. All right. So I, I think we'd be okay. I'll be honest with you, but you know, I'm an optimist. <laughs> yeah, and it's the production rack F when the production when you do last. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah, to, to net this out, I'm not seeing a reason not to, but uh, it might I'm just be cautious anyway. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I gotta tell you, I said I'm an optimist, but I'm also paranoid. And those two things are coming into play, as you can tell. All right. Good yeah, question. I tend to be a bit paranoid too. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Good question. Well, let's talk about the migration process itself, right? Uh, 
as I said earlier, I'm, I'm a big fan of talking about risk. And I think that's sort of the, the word we don't tend to talk about enough. We talk about security, we go into geekiness, we talk about bit strength, but really we're fundamentally in the business of risk management, right? So how do I minimize the risk if I'm doing this movement from a rack of traditional data set, I almost said classic, but a rack of data set in the format that everybody knows and loves and has for a number of years into a vSAM format or to a vSAM encrypted format. Again, you can do it in stages even at that point if you want. Well, the suggestion we're making is let's work on the backup data set first, right? Migrate your backup, and I'm assuming everybody has a backup rack of database because you really should, right? Migrate that backup to vSAM and then run for a period of time with that backup data set. The backup data set does not get nearly the amount of activity. It doesn't get no activity. You know, every update that's done to the primary, assuming you've asked us to replicate uh, changes to the backup, will get replicated to the backup. And the rack of backup data set, it's not a physical copy. So it's not like this cylinder head and record is mapping directly to that one, right? It's a logical copy. If you add a user to, uh, to rack F, we do that to the primary data set, which means we have to find free space. So we go through all our control blocks to find the free space and do all that kind of stuff, add the profile. And then if that's successful, we do the exact same processing on the backup data set. And it may end up in a different location because of the way free space happens to be organized in the backup data set. So it's a logical one. Uh, and my point in bringing this up is that when you do that action, you're actually validating a lot of processing under the covers that you might not have thought that you were. Right. You are actually every update ends up being a whole bunch of read operations and then an update. You have to do the reads to figure out exactly you want to put stuff there. All right. So the concept here is let's do this work on the uh, vSAM backup for, for right. Migrate that. Then do an R very switch and make that backup your primary. Now there are you got to worry about statistical updates and things like that. Make sure you have a good copy at that point. But when you do that R very switch, now you've got the vSAM primary and the non-vSAM backup, right? So if there's something that happens and we haven't seen anything happen in all the testing we've been doing, but you know, gotta be a little paranoid, right? If something happens, you can do an R very switch to get right back out of that, right? So you'd run with the vSAM primary and the non-vSAM backup, right? And then when you're satisfied with how things are, you update the backup data set to vSAM, right? This is a very similar process to those of you who were around in 1990, when RACF went from the non-restructured data set, LRECL 1024, to the restructured data set, LRECL 4096, and the restructure also took some things out of, of the RACF database and moved things around to make it perform much, much, much better. Right? Same idea that we use then, except back then you had to do a plex-wide IPL. If I suggested you had to do a plex-wide IPL to do this, there would be people in IBM. There would be a line of people by, by my office with a, with a baseball bat attempting to re-educate me on why plex-wide IPLs are not allowed. Right now, back in, in RACF's defense in 1990, there was no such thing as a plex-wide IPL because the concept of cisplex really didn't exist yet. Anyway, that's how you manage uh, the, the, the risk right, of doing this migration in the first place. Now there are two ways of going about this, and I just said you you know IPL is you know is, is a bad way of doing it, but it's certainly an option if you can tolerate the concept of all of your systems coming down at once, right? Doing a little work and bringing them back up again. Production environment, no, right? Test environment, yeah, maybe. Development environment, yeah. I think it's a very that's how I did I've done my migrations. We've we've done it the other way as well, but you know I can tolerate bringing my system down for an hour because I need to migrate from one thing to another for the purpose of doing my testing, right? But it's a test environment. So if you're gonna do the, with, with an IPL, what you do is you pick a quiesced time where there's not much RACF activity going on. Then you create a vSAM data set to be the container to be your backup RACF data set. Then you prepare a new data set range table or the ICHR DNT, DSNT thing, you know, that assembler thing, you assemble link edit and then put it in the right place, right? Right, Parmly, by the way, uh, I once said, yeah, it's, it's not particularly exciting to me, right? I didn't realize how much I love having the RACF data set in Parmly. It makes, makes things like this so much simpler. Um, so my, my thanks again to the RACF team folks who put that together, right? So you, you update your system parameter 
through the, either ICH or DSNT or Palm Live to point to this new guy. Then you use the copy utilities that IBM has, IRR UT200 or IRR UT400. First one does just a copy and an analysis. The second one does a full reorg. You do that, populate that backup data set. Then you push the, I was about to say the big blue IPL button, but it's not a big blue IPL button anymore, right? And then you IPL with that new data set and voila, you're there. Now, in the real world, you're not going to want to do that IPL. So we've given you a way to do that. And that, that's a direct outgrowth of our experience 30 years ago with moving to the restructured data set. The way you would do it without an IPL, first step is the same. Create that vSAM data set that is your cluster. It is going to be your RACF database, your backup data set. Then you inactivate your current backup data set. Then you copy the primary data set into the backup data set using U2200. You have to use U2200 for this in the I don't want IPL scenario. Using a brand new parameter in UT200 called PARM equals rename activate. PARM equals rename activate. And when you run IRA UT200 with PARM equals rename activate, in that rename activate command, you are going to give it the name of a data set. We'll talk about the need for that data set right now. So in that new thing, PARM equals rename activate on IRUT200, what UT200 is going to do, you have at entry point, you have an ba inactive backup data set. So UT200 is going to take your inactive backup data set and it's going to rename it to something else. That something else is the data set name, the DSN that you passed in on PARM equals rename activate. Right? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to rename it. And uh, kudos to my uh, my colleague, uh, tester, Paul Petri, who came up with the name archived data set. We're going to call this your archived backup data set, right? So now poof, your backup data set is gone. We have a new one that's going to be, it, it, it's off, uh, it's off somewhere else, right? Well, all right, what are we going to do? We have to have something to be the backup data set. So what we're going to do is UT200 is going to take the data set name that's allocated to SysUT1. And it's going to rename that to the inactive backup data set name. So we've done a little bit of a swap here, right? Your inactive backup that existed when this started has been renamed somewhere else. And this copy that you're about to create has been renamed to the backup data set name, right? We then, UT200 then copies the primary live backup data set, which is allocated to DD name SysRACF, into that backup data set. And then the last thing UT200 does is it activates that backup data set. Now, at that point in time, right now you have, you, you've just renamed your backup data set to something else, renamed something else to your backup data set, copy your primary into your backup, and activated the backup. And I was careful when I went through this scenario to not state that that new backup data set had to be vSAM. It doesn't. Right, this will work with a non-VSAM backup data set, right? A new non-VSAM RACF data set. So you've heard people talk about the R very dance. This is a different way of doing the R very dance. So I'm going to pause here now because that was a lot of tech in a short period of time. And, and questions? All right. Well. It, I got to tell you that most times when I when we first started sketching this out, we sketched it and went over and over and over, and we started um, we started drawing pictures. And I'm going to take you through some of those picture pictures in just a few moments. But just note there are three data sets. You, when you think of UT200, you've always thought of it as I'm copying from here to there. That's it. Two data sets. When you're running rename activate, there are now three data sets in that. You still have your live primary backup excuse me, a live primary data set. You have your inactive backup data set. And then you have the target of the copy operation, right? So the live primary allocated to SysRACF, the inactive backup, that is specified in the DSNT and PARM live, right? The new name for it is in the PARM equals rename activate. And then of course you have the target of the copy operation, which is in DD name SysUT1. 
And I think I've just gone through what those steps that it does. And yep, yeah, let's let's look at some uh, picture. Oh, we'll get to the pictures in just a moment. Let's see what we have here. Oh, one one thing we require is uh, the utility when it begins execution, since it knows the names of all three data sets involved in the operation: the live primary, the inactive backup, and the sysut1 place that you're copying into. The utility checks and makes sure is that you have a generic profile defined. And I do mean generic profile, a generic profile defined. Uh, the reason is we didn't want to give you the opportunity to take your sensitive RACF data set and then copy it to a name that has no protection, right? So you must have a profile defined. We don't validate the quality of that profile. So if you happen to have one that's got a UAC of read, um, an access list with an ID splat entry on it of read or anything. It, we just make sure that there's a profile there and it's your responsibility to make sure that it's a good one. And it should be one, again, it's a copy of your RACF data set. You probably don't want to have, uh, you, you, your access list should be remarkably small uh, for that one. You know, don't collect, don't, don't connect large groups of people to it. It should be very, very small. Anyway, if we don't find a generic profile for each of these three data sets, the utility will do, give you a return code of 12 and that's the end of it. Now, if UT200 detects something has gone wrong during any of these steps, it will go out and it will back out whatever it has done to restore you back to where you were before, right? Now, where you were before will be, oh, my backup is inactive, by the way. So you will still have to go and reactivate the backup. But we, we take you back to the entry point the starting point of UT200. All right, let's go with the pictures because the pictures help make this so much more understandable. Here's what we have. You have the definitions of where your data sets or your RACF data sets are. That will be in ICHR DSNT, the data set names table, or that will be in PARMLIB in IRR PRM XX. And in there, you'll see a uh, the names of these guys. So RACF.prim and RACF.back. In this example, the NV is just simply a notation that says, and that, that's not in the data set range table. That's just a, a way of saying, oh, at this point in time, that's a non-VSAM data set. When it's VSAM, we'll, we'll actually say V for VSAM. That's, again, that's not in the DSNP. RACF, uh, from a at one point of view, really doesn't care if the data set is VSAM or non-VSAM. Certainly not in the data set names table of Parmline. You have your active primary RACF data set starting off as non-VSAM, and we have an active backup data set also starting off as non-VSAM. That's your starting point. So step one, you create that VSAM data set that is going to be the container for your backup data set once we do some further steps in this processing. So you go out, you run JCL very similar to the stuff we looked earlier, and you allocate a VSAM data set of some name. Now, the name that I'm suggesting here, right? RACF.back.vsam, right? And it's data component name of RACF.back.data. The reason why I'm, I'm suggesting that is so that there'll be a relationship, a proper relationship later on when we rename that vsam data set to RACF.back. Remember the vsam convention is you take the cluster name and you append the dot data to it. Well, we're creating that convention now in that yellow vsam data set that we're creating right so that when the rename occurs things will be the way one expects it's not required vsam is perfectly happy to have a cluster name and a data component name that that are not conventional right but somebody who's just looking at things might not realize that all right so you allocate that vsam data set at this point in time it's just a data set sitting there empty of any contents so what happens next Next thing you do is you inactivate your backup data set. So RACF.back, the guy in the upper right here, you do an R very inact on him, and suddenly that data set is inactive. Right now, the utility goes into execution. The first thing it does is it renames RACF.back to something else. That something else is the value, the data set name that you specified on PARM equals rename activate. In this case, it's RACF.back.old. That's the first rename. The next rename is we're taking that RACF.back.vsam data set and we're renaming it to the inactive uh, backup data set name that we found in the range table, right? So note, note here that the box in green, which is either PARM Live or your data set names table, nothing changes in that. 
nothing in the, the in-storage versions of those don't change. We're changing the data sets, playing a little shell game with the data sets, right? Every, all of the renaming occurs with data sets, nothing with anything in storage. So we, we do the rename of that vSAM data set, racf.back.vsam to the inactive racf backup data set name. Uh, and notice now the data component name, racf.back.data matches the vSAM convention of just appending .data at the end. Life is good. All right, so we've done a second rename. Now we can copy the data from the primary data set into that backup data set. So bits will fly by. And at the end, once that's done, we'll have an inactive backup that's been populated with the contents of the primary data set. And the next thing you do is you do an R very uh, active to make the, excuse me, the next thing the utility does it under the covers does an R very active to make that data set active. And life is good. You then do the R very switch, right? Because at this, at this point, now you've got that active backup that's vSAM and the primary is non vSAM. So you run like this for a little while till you're comfortable with things, right? Then you go out and you, once you're comfortable, you do the R very switch. Now, R very switch takes your backup, makes it your primary takes your primary and makes it an inactive backup, makes it an inactive backup. So you'll have to follow that R very switch with an R very activate for the backup data set. Now at this point in time, if you're gonna run like this for a while, don't forget to update either your data set names table, the thing you assemble, link edit and put in the right place, or your Parm Live entry so that, you know, if you IPL in the middle of this, of this pro or if you IPL later on, you're back to where you want to be. Note that racf.back.old just sits off on the side and uh, yeah, you can run like this for a while. And then at the point where you're ready to move your backup to vSAM, you go through the same steps, except this time your backup data set, right? It is non vSAM, right? You're making it to vSAM. And at the end of this, you're in a racf vSAM, vSAM configuration. So those are the pretty pictures. Uh, questions on that? Because there are some underlying assumptions, and Lenny pointed these out when we were in person. Uh, and one of them is, you know, when you're doing that rename processing, we're expecting that if you're sharing your RACF database across systems, you are sharing the catalog across systems as well. Because we do the rename on one system and one system only. But I, I should have worked that in here as an explicit caution. Uh, but there are there were some operational things like that. We did document a whole bunch of that in the systems programmer's guide. So I'll pause again for questions. All right, life is good. Let's continue oh, on then. There's one yeah. question, Mark, in yeah. the uh, in the chat. Uh, I, I can't see the chat from here, unfortunately. Oh, okay. So uh, Marcelo says, that, how do you determine that you are comfortable before switch activate? How do you determine you're comfortable before it's, that's a great question. And I don't have an answer for that. I don't know if it would be expressed in time. If if I were managing a data set, I think the first thing I'd be doing is I'd establish some amount of time and some amount of workload that it would have expected to have occurred. I'd be monitoring for any unusual any unusual messaging out of the Rack F manager. Um, I might be looking at log rec, although I'm, I'm not, nothing's coming out that, that jumping out at me is something that would appear in log rec. Uh, I, I think when we did, we went through this process back in the 90s for moving from non-restructured to restructured, people tended to say, I'm going to stay this way for some amount of time. And it was usually expressed, as, as I recall, in you know small digit months. And, and by the way, that was a much bigger change to RACF because that restructure changed not only the block size, but it changed a whole bunch of internal things. Right. This is a much less less risky move, my opinion. Yeah. So a great question. I, I don't have a great answer for you, unfortunately. I, I I'm very curious to what you guys would think the amount of time but, would be. I would say you'd, you'd want it. Well, I'd want to have one system IPL'd before I commit myself fully to doing the backup, just purely to make sure that I haven't done something, you know. Pardon my French, arse ways with the catalog entries, just to make sure, because some things will work in a fully IPL system that may not work when you're IPLing. So I'd always have, I would always make sure you've done at least one IPL on one system. 
Yeah, actually, yes, and, and not necessarily for catalog issues. And this was actually something that uh, uh, one of my colleagues, right? When we, we, we delivered this in stages and it turns out the move to vSAM, while it was a lot of work for Rack F, right? It, it, uh, it worked pretty well, it worked excellently, in fact. But this person had accidentally started encrypting the Rack F data set, right? Well before the, that I mentioned the three prereqs, they weren't there yet. Right. And everything worked great until an IPL was attempted. And then very, very nicely, you know, the, the folks who did pervasive encryption uh, did, did a really nice job. The open on the system IPLing uh, gave out a nice uh, you know, one of the uh, 163 messages, the vSAM ones that comes out with a return and reason code. And when you looked up the return and reason code, it said could not get key label. And of course, you couldn't get the key label. <laughs> The technology to get the key label at that point in time had yet to be developed, right? So yeah, perfect example of something uh, something that might happen. And, and remember I said, you have to go out and configure ICSF Proclib way. Um, that's one of the reasons to make sure that that information was available early on. So yes, absolutely. It, the IPL test is, is absolutely essential. Yes, thank you. I think I have a caution about something related to this in a few moments. Other questions? That was a good one. All right, let's let's move on a little bit here. So some some parting thoughts of some of this. Uh, the first thing is the RACF manager takes a little more space now. Not a lot more, a little bit more. And if you've had the same JCL since dinosaurs ruled the earth doing the RACF utilities, and they have region equals coded with a hard-coded value that happens to work, and it stops working because you start getting one of those, those memory advents, just code region equals zero K or re, region equals zero M. Trust us, we're not gonna go crazy in the amount of storage we're gonna ask for. And this is all virtual storage user, user style stuff. So yeah, um, I mentioned that additional NQ and that's of the format. It's a sys vsam one with the minor name, the data set name concatenated with the catalog name. I got it backwards a few moments when I said it. Uh, what that means is that it, the RACF utilities should be coded with disk equals share for a RACF vSAM data set. They actually should be coded that way for the non-vSAM ones. It's just not a problem for non-vSAM. How I got to point out that the RACF books had disk equals old in a couple of examples, so we've updated those. And then the next thing is, you know, I, I, presentations, especially ones that are only an hour long, make everything seem simple. <laughs> Right. Well, you know, the first thing is you have to have ICSF set up properly, but wait, there's more. Right. You have to make sure that you have properly defined your disaster recovery so that if something bad should happen, you can recover your RACF environment in your DR site. Right. And to me, that's that's a that's a big a big thought exercise to make sure you've got the procedures in place to make sure that that will actually work. So my, my bottom line recommendation is please do not let the RACF data set be the first data set that you encrypt, right? You should be in, well down your pervasive encryption path uh, before you start considering RACF for encryption. And I'm always curious, um, Bob Hansel did a survey talking about pervasive encryption and not as many folks as I had hoped were starting down that path, right? Well, make sure you're down that path before you, you start doing RACF data set encryption. Oh, other questions, comments? You can uh, unmute your line, folks, if you want to uh, ask a question live. Mm -hmm. Or post them in the chat. We don't bite. <laughs> we don't. I love these questions. Yeah. So I, I want to bring up something that Lenny brought up, which was the concept of the master catalog. And is your master catalog a single point of failure. Now, catalogs have been pretty robust over the last, you know, double digit sets of years. Uh, but there are some, some things that one might think about. Um, one of which is, do you want your RACF data set cataloged in the master catalog or in a user cat? Um, the folks who talk about user cat, in fact, if you have your RACF data set in a user cat, cataloged in a user catalog, you get a message during IPL. Right, and I always thought that was an informational message. My colleagues over in, in um, vSAM said, no, it's, it's really kind of a cautionary message. And what it's saying is that user catalog 
is going to be allocated connected to a data space. So you won't be able to do any maintenance on that until that catalog has been freed. Just bear in mind that the RACF data set uh, is opened at IPL time for the most part, and it stays open until you either, well, you, you do a ZEOD, you basically shut down, or you do an R very inact for the RACF data set. So there's just, a, just an observation that that's what that message means uh, for those of you who are cataloging the RACF data set in a user cat. Um, we have a question mark. Um, RACF utilities work the same way with RACF vSAM as with the old RACF format? Yes. So uh, pretty much. So some of the utilities didn't have to change. UT200, since it doesn't chinty under the covers, pff, did not change at all. The other utilities, most of the other utilities did have to get updated to, uh, to understand some of the RACF internals of how to connect to a vSAM data set. But once the, once the utility retrieves the record, Right, the processing of the utility works exactly the same. Right, so we did make changes to 200, 400 block update, which is UT300. Um, there are a couple of utilities that are unrelated to the database. BRW00 is an example. Um, uh, database unload had to be modified. I'm trying to go through. There was another one that didn't have to be modified. Oh, RID00 didn't have to be modified because it takes the process, the output of database unload. So yes, uh, the, the, the question asked, do, do the utilities all understand? Yes, they do. And I, I, that, actually, that, that brings up a, a, an interesting point. Uh, the copy utility, UT200, right? It used to call IEB Jenner under the covers. Right or ice Jenner if you happen to have DF sort licensed, um, it now calls IDCAMs under the covers in all cases. So there's actually a small difference you might see if you actually look at the output of UT200 specifically, the pieces of information that are spit out by the copying utility. You'll now see um, IDCAMs statements as opposed to IEB Jenner. You know the processing ended at EOD statement. So any, other, any, any other questions for Mark? Sorry, I have another question. It's Go Kira. for it, Kira. Thank you. What happens with the range table? I mean, did, will that still work the same way? You've just got to have, say, if you've got three data sets in your range table, you need three sets of VSAM files. Yes, yes. A excellent question. Yes, none, none of those externals change, right? So your, your range table or your PARM lib entry, the now preferred way of doing the range table, uh, well, is works exactly the same. This is a little side thing. Uh, early on, when we were exploring vSAM, we actually thought of moving to a vSAM KSDS and letting it do all of the indexing and things like that. And and that, quite frankly, scared us once we started thinking about it. So that's why we, we ratcheted things back. Linear data set. It's it's basically we're changing from. I'm referencing things by cylinder head and record to I'm referencing it by record number. Everything else say the same, the range table, data set names, all those things. Okay. Good, good question. Um, I might uh, do this quite soon actually, Mark, because I think I said the other day that I'm working on this like greenfield, like RACF system at the moment. It's like no users, empty RACF database and the sysprog, sent me an email yesterday saying, oh, I'd like to put, move the RACF data sets to different volumes. I think this might be a good test, don't you? <laughs> it's actually an opportune time to do that because yeah. you are by definition stopping your RACF environment. You can't move a RACF, well, yeah. you can, but it's going to break things. Uh, you, you really can't move a RACF data set safely while it's in No, use. no, so you gotta no. Do that. So now, I think it's a good, good use case, yeah. It, it is. Now, is this an environment where there it, it's actually, you have a you have just enough time to do what you need to do? Yes, yeah, oh. just, yeah, yeah. Excellent. There's no production system at the moment. There will be eventually, but this is kind of okay. got the build system and it's just no users on there apart from me and there's this prog at the moment, so. Are they set up for pervasive encryption yet? Not yet, no. Okay, so you'll no, be moving coming. to them. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's just yeah. preparatory, yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's, a, that's a perfect candidate for, all right, so you're going to do the migration twice, once yeah. to get the vSAM, and then once to go from vSAM to encrypted vSAM. Yeah, that's just better. baby steps. <laughs> yeah. The yep. paranoid would like, the paranoid like multiple small steps. as opposed Yes. To and yes, Kira, I will be doing an IPL. <laughs> yep.
Okay, any uh, final thoughts, questions? Well then, listen, thank you everybody. And yeah, please do the survey. Like to get invited back. And I'm really looking forward to coming back in November, in person. Yes, we are too. So yes, folks, um, I've just popped the link in uh, for the feedback into the chat. So you can just click on that and that will take you directly to the uh, Mark's uh, feedback. So if you could do that, be most grateful. Okay. Um, just a couple of things. Um, so big, big thank you, Mark, for uh, for your for your session. Um, really, really, really enjoyed it as ever. Um, what I will say is, uh, so I was mentioning to Mark just before we came on air earlier that um, in the June meeting, maybe maybe delayed to the conference, there is someone has actually contacted me to say that they have done this, um, and they've done the encryption as well. And they might do a live demo of it at the June meeting, possibly the conference. They're not quite sure yet. So, um, so that that will be. And I think you can guess who that person is. <laughs> um, but uh, so we we will look forward to that. Well, I, and, I will buy a, I'll, I will buy a beer for every person who asked a question, and two beers for the person who volunteered to do that. Do it. Yeah. Oh well, maybe I'll go for that because I'm going to do it next. <laughs> but no, he he's right. done. He's already done it, so maybe he deserves the beer. But um, but yeah, on that note, actually, the GSC. So I think I've mentioned this a few times before. The next GSC Security Working Group um, will be on Thursday, the 29th of June. We're just trying to find a venue at the moment um, because it's going to be a hybrid, um, and 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 also you'll be able to join us um, um, via Zoom, and that's going to be open to both GSE members and non-GSE members. Um, you can get to Mark's presentation. By the way, he's already uploaded it to the GSC website. If you're not a member um, of GSE, I think there's an email that's just been sent out that non-members can, for the next two months, get access to the content, both the recording and uh, the, the the slides that presenters have put up there, and the user ID and password has been been sent out in that in that email, I believe. Um, I also want to say that the conference isn't over yet. So at five o'clock UK time, um, there's going to be a keynote. Um, which sounds very interesting. It is um, with uh, Data Kinetics, and it's the, the title is "Is the Grass Really Green?" So that should be quite interesting. And then at the end of that, there will be a closing. Mark will do a close of the uh, closing speech for the conference. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to all of our presenters on the security stream. We've done 14 sessions over the last three days, and um, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it, as, as I always do. So a big, big thank you to the presenters. It takes so much time, you know, to prepare. Always look, Mark makes it look so easy with his slides, but it all takes a lot of time and, you know, in preparation. So big, big thank you to, to everyone. And also to all of you for making the effort to attend and support us. I also want to say an extra special thank you to Megan, who's been our wonderful Zoom um, support um, assistant over the last three days in the background, who is the proud owner of Alan, the cat who you've probably seen on social media <laughs> with his little bow tie. And also a big thank you to Mrs. Parsons. Um, so thank you, Sue, for um, all the work that you've done as well. Can I, can I say a big thank you to Jamie for organising it? Oh, yeah. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I, I just asked, I've been, we were just saying actually at the GSE conference planning session, believe it or not, we start planning for next year, this uh, conference in, in as early as December. And uh, I, I was actually, when we have to, all of the chairs have to do a, like a, an annual report type thing. And I was just saying that me and Carolyn have, how many years is it now, Carolyn, we've clocked up as chair. Too many. <laughs> too many. I think it's coming up to 13. Yeah. So, um, so yes, if anybody is interested, by the way, in becoming the next chair of, uh, on deputy chair of the security working group, then um, please do drop Mark Wilson an email. Um, and, uh, but we, I think we agreed, didn't we, Carolyn? We were happy to carry on for now. Yeah. 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 So yeah, thank you everybody. Um, like I say, don't uh, don't uh, don't hang up just yet. That I say we'll we'll close this, and then 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 the the uh, the final keynote of the conference will start at five o'clock UK time. Um, and yep, yeah, thanks for thanks for joining us, and have a drink tonight. <laughs> I think you deserve it. <laughs> thanks everyone. See you soon. Thank thanks. you, Mark. Bye. Have a good one.